Oh, awesome. Uh, you were in South Africa in 1992, mm -hmm. um, shooting with uh, uh, Malcolm X. Yeah, shooting Malcolm X with Spike Lee. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Welcome to Framing Futures. Uh, a conversation series between emerging filmmakers and the masters of the medium. Today, we are in conversation with the director uh, and cinematographer, Ernest R. Dickerson. Uh, and he's joined in conversation by Usfi Sokanyile, our South African filmmaker. Uh, we would like to acknowledge, firstly, the sponsors behind this program. Um, this project would not have been made possible if it wasn't for the Raised by Wolves team. Um, so we are very grateful to them for hosting, I mean, for, for having this program happen. Um, Film Africa, Scott Free Productions, HBO Max, and we are hosted by Homebrew in their studio. So thank you to them. Um, I'd like to quickly do a quick introduction to Usfiso. Um, Usfiso is our moderator tonight, and he is the producer the di and director of Anafora Films. He has worked as a content producer in, uh, on SABC shows such as Imagine Africa, Zooming In on Men, Talk SA, and Hatch. After st uh, studying, Kanyula directed uh, Super, Superman and Romeo in 2008, a groundbreaking short documentary. And he's gone on to make some really incredible work for BBC, um, Seishan TV in China. Kanyula's first feature documentary film was um, the acclaimed Uprise um, in 2017. And he followed that recently with a new country that's done so well, both locally and internationally. So we're very happy to have him here. We're so honored to have Ernest here. And I'm gonna let, uh, and also I of course want to say thank you to our guests, our filmmakers from South Africa, from across the country, emerging voices that are here to join in this conversation. Um, there will be an opportunity after the 40 minute conversation with Ernest for them to raise questions personally with Ernest. And I'm hoping this will be an enriching experience for all of us, you know. Uh, so we want it to be a round table where we can be open and honest and have a great conversation. I think it's a great opportunity. Uh, so I'm very excited, of course. <laughs> so I'm handing it over to Sfiso. Hi, Ernest Dickerson, how are you? I'm good, glad to Thank be here. You. Thank you for joining us, it's such an honor. Thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, you um, you know I just, uh, looked your profile up, and it's you know there's nothing you it feels like there's nothing you haven't done. I mean you've worked in animation, you've um, you know um, worked in a lot of genre films, sci-fi, horror, um, television, drama series, and as well as feature films. Um, what what has that journey been like? Is there anything that still excites you? Uh, yeah, the next project always excites me, you know, always looking forward for the next one. Um, and I like to think that my best work is still ahead of me. Um, there's uh, so many projects that uh, my wife and I are planning on and, you know, we want to get those made. So, you know, just want to keep working. Oh, awesome. Uh, you were in South Africa in 1992 mm -hmm. um, shooting with um, uh, Malcolm X. Yeah, shooting Malcolm X with Spike yeah. Lee, yeah. And uh, you're here again now, uh, filming, uh, directing Raised by Wolves. Um, what was the experience like then, and you know, and what is it like now for you? Have you seen any sort of visible or real changes? Yeah, in 92, it was scary. It was scary, because apartheid was still in full effect. And um, uh, we flew to uh, Johannesburg to shoot uh, images of Soweto and also to shoot Nelson Mandela, because he was going to be at the end of the film, be in the film, to uh, echo some of Malcolm's uh, most famous words. And um, the ANC were our sponsors. And uh, it, was, it was scary. It was scary on the way down. We landed in Nairobi to refuel. We, we were flying from, from Athens. We'd spent 10 days in Cairo shooting Cairo. Then 
we couldn't fly from Cairo to South Africa, so we had to fly to Athens. Then from Athens down to uh, down to South Africa, we landed in Nairobi to uh, to refuel, and uh, got back in the plane, took off, and five minutes later, plane did an about turn, landed back because they had been told there was a bomb on board. Wow. So we had to get off, and uh, and they searched the plane. There was no bomb, but um, there was a big greeting that was scheduled for us at the airport in uh, Johannesburg and by since we got there like five four or five hours later everybody went home <laughs> so you know kind of diffused that whole thing but it was it was scary then because apartheid was in full swing and and um, everybody was convinced that there was going to be a war everybody was convinced there was going to be a a violent revolution there was going to be blood in the streets yeah. and um, as the world saw it, that never happened. It, yeah. it was a peaceful transi uh, transition. And I think in '92 there was um, quite a bit of action on the streets, uh, actually. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of sort of like factional wars, uh, battles. So what was it like on location? Just like filming, were there any sort of unpredictable aspects or? Uh, it was just you know um, seeing you know everybody had to belong to. Um, a political affiliation. Everybody had to be affiliated with some political party. Um, and I remember we were shooting in Soweto and these young boys did a, a little uh, chant for us, which was a love song to the AK-47. Wow. You know, like, Viva, Viva, AK, Viva, Viva, AK, Barrao, Pow, Pow. And when you look at, the, look at these little guys, and they must have been about eight or nine years old, and you could see in their eyes that they meant what they were saying. You know, they were ready for war. So it was, it was tense. It was really tense. Yeah, I was, um, I was really young then, but I, I, I remember seeing at some point, maybe it was, this was a bit, a bit later, but seeing the posters for, for the film. Mm. Um, and I was actually wondering about that, just like the psychology of the time and how, even though it was a transitional period, you know, the ANC was, hadn't really gotten into power. So, you know, how were people sort of negotiating um, things like that, like a film about Malcolm X, you know, sends a, a clear message, mm -hmm. you know, about self-determination, about re ideas of revolution or whatever. And so just having that in the public space for me, engaging with like the kids that you were talking about and just thinking about what that meant. Yeah, it was, it was interesting because, uh, um, Nelson was one take Nelson. <laughs> it was like you get one take with Nelson and that's it. Um, and, you know, uh, I, you know, I lit it and I was also operating the camera. Um, and um, he said Malcolm's words. He agreed to say, uh, echo one of Malcolm's most famous speeches, you know, we, we demand the right to be a man. But he would not say at the end by any means necessary. And I think where he was going politically at that time, he could not say that. Yeah. Uh, so that's why it cuts from, in the movie, it cuts from Nelson to Malcolm. Get, get into the speech to Malcolm saying by any means necessary. Uh -huh. So, um, but um, <laughs> I'm sure he had a lot on his plate and he gave us, you know, enough time to come in, you know, and shoot the scene and do it quickly and efficiently and then he was gone. For sure. You're here almost 30 years later, mm -hmm. uh, directing Raised by Wolves. Mm -hmm. um, what does it feel like? I mean, It has been a wonderful trip here. Um, my wife and I are enjoying Cape Town immensely. Um, I don't know, it just feels so much more progressive, you know, it feels so much more like a positive future here than, than a lot of times what we feel in the United States. You know, we look at the news a lot. We were looking at the news last night, and um, they were talking about the the number of uh, of mass shootings that have happened in the United States just in the past several months. Um, white supremacy is trying to come back in the United States. They're trying to uh, they're trying to bring back Jim Crow laws. The Republican Party is. Uh, they know that the only way they can get into power and stay into power is to prevent people from voting. And so that's what they're doing. They're instituting these, these draconian laws and, uh, to really make it harder for people of color to vote. 
because the reason they didn't uh, win this last time is because so many people did go out and vote. And, uh, and that's what we have to keep doing if we're going to keep the United States as a democracy. Because my fear is that, you know, Donald Trump is talking about running again in 2024. And uh, uh, I think if uh, the Republicans get that power again, they're not going to give it up. Wow. So there's a responsibility on, you know, filmmakers and artists to... To, to let people know that, people. yeah. Yeah, to keep yeah. people aware of, of what some of these some of these policies that are being instituted by the governors and the, and the you know, Republican governors in the states are doing, like what happened in Georgia, you know. Um, and I think like 30-something other states throughout the United, uh, the U.S. So it's, um, it's scary. Um, in thinking about, we were talking earlier on about, you know, some of your work, um, especially the earlier work being political and, you know, um, some of the work is, um, deals with fantasy. You do a lot of horror films, mm -hmm. um, sci-fi. Mm -hmm. um, I think you worked in animation as well. Not much animation yet. Okay, but uh, but we're planning on it. <laughs> okay. Um, just thinking about like projects like Raised by Wolves, for example. Uh -huh. I mean, do they sort of like provide like an escape uh, for you? What is it that um, what draws you into stories like? Um, like Raised by Wolves? Well, I've been a, a reader uh, of science fiction since I was like eight years old. Um, and um, I was really, really, I mean, I was reading a lot of science fiction, which didn't have too many people of color in it, you know, but in 1968 or 69, I found a book written by Samuel Delaney who at that time was the premier African-American science fiction writer, a book called Nova. And that really blew me away. And, um, and so, but I've always read science fiction. You know, science fiction uh, um, and horror, the best of it is, is about us. It's about the human condition. You know, it's, it's, it's a different way of looking at uh, uh, the things that are affecting us as people, you know. You know, like, what does it mean to be human? You know, you can explore political systems in so many different ways through science fiction. Uh, this, the TV series Star Trek did that, the original Star Trek. They, uh, they used the science fiction medium to, to explore racism, to explore different political ideas, ideologies. Um, and um, it's a way of doing that um, in a way that's also entertaining for the audience. So it's, it's what Steve Wonder used to call edutainment. Uh -huh. You know, where you're educating through entertaining. So, um, and you know, uh, uh, science fiction is also speculating on, you know, where we are going, where we could go, you know, where we could go if we're doing the right thing, where we could go if we don't do the right thing. And um, uh, that's why I think it's really important. Um, you know, even a show like Raised by Wolves, you know, it is about humans. It is about what, what does it mean to be human? And what have we done as humans to our world and other worlds? What are you doing to other worlds? And I've actually, I'm actually remembering now that your, the, your first, the first feature film that you shot was uh, Brother from Another Planet, mm -hmm. which also has uh, quite a bit of John social Sales. commentary. Yeah, John Sales yeah. directed it, yeah. Um, it was. It was. Uh, it was exploring the black experience uh, in America through the eyes of uh, of an alien, you know, who's who's an escaped slave, who's who is actually on a kind of underground railroad, that an intergalactic underground railroad that that exists, and uh, and uh, it was just a great script, and it was a good way of exploring, you know, our relationships with each other, and. Uh, and get into our history a little bit too. It's a, it's a cult classic. I see it uh, resurfacing with uh, conversations around Afrofuturism. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing it coming coming up a lot. Do you um, <clears throat> is the stuff that you see now in you know in working in Raised by Wolves, for example, that you look back at and say, you know, if we had like this kind of technology in 1984, um, <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> this would have been great for Brother from Another Planet or. 
Yeah, well, I'm always I'm always joking with the cinematographers that I'm working with because uh, now they have some of the toys that I wish I had had. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, the different lighting systems. You know, uh, you know, we just did a, a shot yesterday that you know just was a use an incredible little piece of technology to just you know uh, do stuff. I, I think you know the last film I shot was Malcolm X as a director of photography, and that was 1992, and that was still shooting film. You know, yeah. and that was still shooting. Uh, God, I guess you call it old school. <laughs> you know, I guess it's old school. You know, um, and now uh, in this new digital age, you know, with these new lights, these LED lights, like you guys have here and everything. And I just wish I. Oh, I keep saying I wish. Oh man, <laughs> if I had these toys when I was a shooter. Oh boy. <laughs> has has it changed the way you prepare for for films, even as a director? How? You, you know, thinking about like, you know, how you want it lit and... Well, um, uh, you know, a show like Raised by Wolves, it's, uh, it is freeing because um, you have to imagine a lot of things that are going to be put in later. Um, and, you know, draw them. You know, I do storyboards. I do my storyboards okay. so, we, so I can show people, you know, what my intention is, uh, what it should look like. And it's, uh, the cameras are freer now to do that than they used to be. There used to be so many restrictions on doing visual effects. You know, there was a time when in order to do a visual effect, you cannot move the camera. The camera had to be locked off and not moved. Um, and uh, the big advances in, in technology uh, over the years, I think it all really kind of really started with Star Wars. You know, in 1977, because um, they they really nailed blue screen technology in film. Um, they got it really close in Star Wars. They really perfected it in The Empire Strikes Back. That's where they nailed it. And um, and then it just got just kept getting better and better and better and better. So uh, now you can. You know, you can do so many things. I, I'm, I'm amazed by some of these young filmmakers I see in Nigeria. I see these kids shooting science fiction films on their cell phones, and they got green screens, and they and they use their computers, their home computers, to do you know to com, you know compose the images. You know, and it's amazing stuff. You know, so uh, I have a great deal of hope for the Afrofuturist <laughs> movement. Yeah. Um, I just want to. Go back to, you know, I think in the 90s, mm -hmm. uh, your, you know, directorial debut was uh, Juice. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a time where, you know, you worked or you cast uh, rappers in, 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 in leading roles in, in a few of your films. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me about that? Like, what, what was the motivation? It's well, when I did Juice, um, I was looking for young actors. I was looking for unknowns. And uh, the only rapper, or the only person who became a rapper was Tupac. When we found Tupac, he was still a background singer and a roadie for Digital Underground. Uh -huh. He had not cut his first album yet. He uh, was ba virtually unknown to the public. So uh, I cast him as an actor. And he was a ballet dancer. He had studied ballet, yeah. He, you could see it in the way he walked. <laughs> You know, because his feet were always kind of like, <laughs> you know, played out, you know. Um, but I was looking, you know, um, I was casting for unknowns for Juice. And, um, and you know, yeah, you know, I was uh, uh, casting some, some rappers. And actually, uh, uh, Tretch from Naughty by Nature came in to audition and, you know, did a pretty good job. And... Um, there was this guy that was hanging out with him. And the character of Bishop, I was having a hard time finding the right person for that. So um, uh, Tretch had this, this, this other young brother that was hanging out with him. And I was getting frustrated. I said, well, what about you, man? You want to you know, you audition? He said, me? I said, yeah. I said, yeah. He said, uh, yeah, sure, why not? So I gave him the sides for the character of Q, which eventually went to Omar Epps. And he went away, read it, came back, auditioned, did a pretty good job, but something told me to try something else. And I said, could you do me a favor and read for the character of Bishop? Can you stay a little bit longer and read for the character of Bishop? And he said, yeah, sure. 
and uh, he went away, came back, and did bishop. And, um, and you know, you don't always let the actor know right away. You don't say, wow, that's great. You know, you always, you know, he said, okay, thank you very much. So we have your number? Yeah. What's your name? He said, uh, Tupac. Oh, wow, that's an interesting name. He said, yeah, it's a Mayan deity. So he's named after a Mayan deity. Deity, oh. And, um, and, I, and, and he said, Tupac Shakur. And I said, any relation to Asada Shakur, who was famous in the States, you know, her association with oh, yeah. the Black Panthers and everything. And he said, yeah, that's my aunt. And it's like, oh, wow, you know, tell him we said hi. So he left and we said, that's him, you know. And, and he came in as an actor. Now, while he was acting, while he was doing the film, he always had a little notebook with him. And in between setups, he would always go in a corner and write in the notebook. I don't know what he was writing. It's quite possible that he was writing some of the music that we're here now, we hear now. So, but he was always interested in people. You know, he would uh, meet people, you know, see somebody look like they had a story or something, or look like they were having a hard time. You know, he'd go over and talk to them. You know, he was always very, very interested in people. And so um, I like to think that while he was shooting the movie, he was writing his first. Oh, wow. And it became a, a cult classic. I mean, um, you know, you know, I think everyone knows Juice. People talk about it in every ghetto in the world. Yeah. I found that out later, you know, because <laughs> when you do a movie, you're just glad you got through it. Yeah. You know, you're, you're glad that it made some money for the studio. You know, you hope that it, you know, will help you get another movie, you know, and um, and it was hard for me to watch that because I can't watch my movies, you know. So I didn't watch Juice for years, and then my daughter told me that that her that her friends have Juice parties. Oh wow! Where they recite the movie, they you know they know the dialogue by heart. And I'm like, are you kidding? <laughs> I'm like, you know, wow. So it's yeah. uh, I'm I'm glad. And we were able to celebrate. My wife uh, really spearheaded the uh, 25th anniversary uh, DVD and uh, Blu-ray release. Oh, yes. Yeah, which actually found a lot of um, behind-the-scenes information, uh, you know, EPKs that were done, uh, stuff, you know, shot on set of me directing the guys and everything, and interviews oh, yeah. with the guys that hadn't been seen before, so we were able to put that together. What, with like director's commentary, like that sort of stuff? Um, yeah, there is a director's commentary, but, but mostly, you know, behind the scenes stuff of me directing, uh, directing the guys, um, uh, interviews with uh, uh, Hank and Keith Shockley, who did the music for the film. Okay. Um, and, uh, which is really good, because, you know, they, they talk about the technology that they used. Uh, so yeah, old school technology, old school electronics to to achieve the the sound of the film. So, um, but uh, just doing that, just getting that made was a five year struggle for my for my wife. So, you also worked with uh, DMX. Mm -hmm. um, he's always in peace. Um, yeah, yeah. What was that like? And I mean, news of him passing. Was... Yeah, that really hurt us. You know, we. We thought he had a chance to make it. You know, we were getting such conflicting reports um, about whether he was in intensive care or what. Uh, DMX was an interesting guy to work with. I think he had a photographic memory. Um, he would come in and not be sure of what scene we're reading, but in the makeup chair, he would read it and come on set and had it down pat. Wow. You know. Um, you know, working with musicians, you know, who have a, a, a different concept of time than a lot of folks, you know. <laughs> uh, sometimes musicians show up late. Yeah. You know. Um, and there was one day DMX showed up very late. But then he, uh, we were celeb you know, we were shooting on Valentine's Day. And he came in with roses for every single one of the ladies on the cast and crew. Now you can't stay mad at a guy like that. You know, he was just a, he was just a wonderful brother. You know, yeah. and um, and loved electric car, electronic cars. He would he would always kind of announce he was approaching set because 
he would have these radio controlled cars that would precede him. You know, the car would come first, yeah. you know, and then, you know, about a half a block behind was DMX, you know, using his little control and everything. But uh, he was great to work with. In, uh, <clears throat> in commemorating him, there was, you know, a lot of photos and clips coming up. Um, people were bringing up clips from um, um, the Hype Williams film, um, where him and Nas, where he stars alongside Nas. Uh, I think mm -hmm. it was called Belly. Oh, yeah, Belly, right, yeah. right, right. Uh -huh. But it got me thinking about that time and about the 90s and, mm -hmm. you know, casting rappers in, you know, in films. Was it, um, was it linked to any way, was it in, in any way linked to maybe um, trying to target the, you know, the, the audience that was listening to rap music? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, I mean, the film industry has been doing that forever. You know, that's why they put Al Jolson in movies. You know, that's why they put Elvis yeah. Presley in movies, you know. Uh, they were always trying to find, a, you know, Frank Sinatra was in movies, you know, they were always trying to find somebody that would be easier to sell to the audience who already had an identity, you know, which, you know, came through music, you know. So, yeah, this was um, kind of the same thing. This was an independent film. Uh, Never Die Alone was an independent film produced by Ed Pressman. Um, and it was uh, based on a novel by Donald Goins, who... Um, is interesting. He was one of America's premier African American pulp fiction writers. And um, his books are really interesting because they're, they're the work of somebody who has actually lived that life. And, you know, they're based on people that he knew. Um, and, uh, it's uh, Donald Goins' novels are very well known in the hip hop community. And uh, I understand that in Europe, he's given the same sort of respect that Chester Himes has given and was never given in the United States. Um, and so we always tried to tell the releasing studio that they should, you know, really, you know, check out Donald Goins' you know, his, uh, the people that read him, you know, he's well known in Europe, you know, you got to really sell this as a Donald Goins adaptation, you know, an adaptation of a Donald Goins novel. Uh, but they never did that. And a lot of people went to, you know, went to see the movie. A lot of people didn't see the movie. And I heard some people say, wow, if I didn't know it was a Donald Goins adaptation, I would have gone see it, you know. Um, but um, he's still a writer of okay. fiction that, you know, whose works can still be uh, mined for, um, for films. Would you be interested in looking at his other titles? And maybe oh, yeah, films? yeah. There was actually another film that we were going to do, uh, but when Never Die Alone didn't do well commercially, it fell through. So. Oh, man. Um, something I didn't know about, about your work is that you, you know, you directed or one of the directors on The Wire. Mm -hmm. Which I mean, for a lot of people, it's you know it changed television, mm -hmm. um, you know, or the you know the drama format. Um, <clears throat> what was that like? I mean, the transition from cinema to TV, and you know the expectations. Um, well, I had I had shot TV. I had worked in television as a director of photography. Uh, in the '90s, I was uh, uh, I was the original cinematographer on the show Law and Order. I, I photographed the first six episodes, I believe. And then um, I had an out in my contract because Spike had a movie coming up, so I was going to go to a movie. So I knew, you know, the speed of television. Um, and The Wire, uh, it was just a great, uh, a great company to work for. David Simon, uh, Nina Noble, uh, who was one of the producers I had worked with years before. But uh, they were just such great scripts. And um, great cast. Um, many of us are still in touch with each other today, you know. Um, and uh, and Baltimore is just a, such an interesting city. So yeah, it was a good show. It was uh, one of those shows you miss when it stops, you know. Because um, and David Simon always had just a five-year plan for it, you know. And wow. And he got his five years. He, he didn't know he was going to get it because 
HBO always waited to like almost like the very last second to say that they were going to be renewed for another season. So, you know, he, he was always convincing the actors, don't take another job, don't take another job, you know. And we know that they were like, well, we got to eat, you know. Are we going to yeah. work again or not, you know. But, uh, but it was, uh, the scripts were just great and the actors are just, were just amazing. Is there a point where you, I don't know, sort of fall in love with television and maybe not think too much about cinema? Well, I like to put, I like to think I'm still dealing with cinema. I'm just dealing with cinema on television. I'm just thinking mm -hmm. that the, uh, the, the means of presentation is different. Um, especially now in times of COVID, we can't, you know, we can't go to movie theaters. So, uh, and I've always approached each of my television projects as a, a, a movie, as a small movie, a, a short film. So, um, so for me, it's just the, the presentation is just not really that much smaller because so many people now have uh, flat screen TVs. Oh, yeah. You know, so many people have large screen television. So in a way, it has enabled uh, television to become more cinematic because, you know, there was a time when it was just the box and television was always this. But now with the wider screens, you can, you can put a person in a landscape. You can play the landscape and have a small person in it. You know, that's one of the things I was playing with on Walking Dead, you know, mm. that you know, we had that great landscape. And, and I think from a story point of view as well, in terms of like character development and that sort of thing, I think TV is uh, sort of going in the cinema direction. Yeah, well, it's, it's, well, the one good thing about it is that, you know, when you do a movie, you know, you always got to try and keep it to 90 minutes or under two hours. And when you start cutting stuff, a lot of the stuff that winds up getting cut is character development, you know, to keep the story going. But now you can let those arcs just kind of, you can let those arcs take their time and grow over, over several weeks, you know, in the television and, um, and still give it a cinematic feel. So um, that's, I think that's one of the great things about TV now. Um, that it is uh, is growing, and um, it has become the medium that everybody wants to get into now, because uh, it's getting so much harder to make a movie. Yeah, it's really hard to get a, to get financing. You know, the average time to make a movie is what five to eight years. You know, I mean, Juice was ten. Wow. You so know. you had that script in your back pocket while you. Yeah, it sat on the shelf for all that time. Because when I first tried to take it out, everybody said, nobody wants to see this. You know, everybody said, oh, it's too dark. It's too dark. Don't, don't, no, nobody wants to make this movie. And then um, it, it kind of got seen by accident just because, you know, my co-writer got a new agent. So, so what um, direction do you think we're heading in? I mean, um, the theaters are not going to be opening anytime soon. No, but we have TV's streaming. TV's getting popular, you know, yeah. the, the streaming services. We have streaming. Um, I think we're seeing projects uh, that, are, that are being shot that are a little bit more daring, you know, because they don't have to worry about how much money they're going to make on the opening weekend. A lot yeah. of times that was a big determining <clears throat> factor for getting a film made or what kind of a film got made. And so you see so many different types of stories, you know, for the streaming services now. And I think that's... Uh, I think that's been great. I think there's more people of color in the United States uh, shooting. Um, I mean, Raised by Wolves, um, it's great because uh, I directed the first two episodes and uh, Suno Gunera is directing the next two episodes. So you got two directors of color directing half the show season, you know, half the, the show for the second season. Um, and so I think it's now television shows are able to explore different subject matters, you know, in ways that they normally might not have done before, you know. Uh, so I think that's where we're heading. And hopefully we'll see, we'll see more and more work by people of color. Um, and there's enough room, I'd like to believe. There is. There is. Um, you know, we keep hearing about so many different stories that are, that are coming up. The next show I'm gonna do is um, a show for Ava DuVernay's company. And um, 
and Rosario Dawson is the lead, and uh, Benjamin Bratt is the second lead. So you got two Latino leads, you know, and uh, and um, and I think we're going to see more and more of that. And do you think the lines are going to blur? Because I feel like right now there's a clear distinction between like studio work and independent work. Um, do you think those structures will sort of like stay in place? Or will you see like a rise in a lot of like sort of independent filmmakers with like unique voices uh, well, coming up? We need independent film, you know. I mean, you know, we need, that's the thing I love about cinema, and I'm talking about theatrical and television. I'm, I'm putting it all together. Um, we need all of it. You know, we need, uh, we need those uh, independent voices. Uh, we need, you know, like uh, Nomadland, you know, which was a beautiful movie. Minari, which, uh, yeah. which is a gorgeous little film. I don't know if you've seen it, but that got, um, uh, I think that's been streaming on some of the services. Now it's up for nominations. You know, Stephen Yun, who is in Walking Dead, is, is the lead in it. He's, he's, he's great. Um, so, and that's a little independent $2 million movie. You know, that's made quite a bit of money. So I think, uh, you know, I think it's uh, opening up for everybody. I like to think. I'm ever the optimist. Are there, are there any, <laughs> uh, any emerging or young or fresh voices that you're aware of that you're excited about? Uh, gosh, yeah, a lot. Um, uh, the, the lady who directed uh, No Man Land. Uh, the Chinese, the Chinese director, um, she did a beautiful job with that. Um, I think it was a Korean American director who directed, uh, Minari. Uh, and, um, uh, saw a really, really, really interesting, uh, British horror film called His House, which was, uh, released. I forget the director's name, young, young director, first time director who did a, a masterful job on that. So, um, yeah, there's a, I think with streaming now, it's, it's open to more and more, more and more voices. Something I, uh, I read, which I almost forgot about, you um, took a class um, with um, Haile Gerema, who's, mm -hmm. you know, has a, a great legacy in independent cinema. I mean, what was that like? I mean. Well, it was, it was such it was, a strong voice, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, highly. Well, he's he's one of my fathers, you know. <laughs> yeah. He, uh, uh, I was at Howard University, but I wasn't a film student. I was studying architecture, but I had a strong interest in film, and um, and uh, I decided to uh, take some electives, some classes in cinematography, and you know, and and some cinema classes with highly. So. Um, uh, he just turned me on to the possibilities of cinema. He turned me on to the power of cinema. Um, you know, with highly, cinema is a way of life. Creating cinema is a way of life. And all films are political. And, you know, he, he taught me how to look at films and to see the meaning in them. Uh, yeah, highly, highly, highly great. He, um, and his movies were so were, were, were really inspiring. Um, I really love uh, the credit he took for his film Bush Mama. Oh yes, because he was shooting yeah. in 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 L.A. and the police actually came and arrested him. You know, and while the camera's running, you see Haile <laughs> being arrested. And where the credit of director goes, instead of instead of director by it was answerable. <laughs> Haile Garema. <Yeah. laughs> you know, he, I'm answerable for this movie. And that's what a director is. You're answerable for the movie. Because, I mean, his work was overtly political mm -hmm. at a time where it was almost dangerous to mm -hmm. be putting out those kind of statements. Yeah. You know? And they were, you know, inspiring to see those films because they were, they were students at, at uh, USC or UCLA. Um, I forget which one, but you know they were film students there, and they were, um, you know, they were making fiercely political. The LA Rebellion, right? Yeah. You think that you might come back and shoot another film in South Africa soon? I think I'd like to. 
because we really enjoyed it here. Um, it's a beautiful country, beautiful people. Um, you know, we want to, ex we really, we really wish we had more time. We want to go to Johannesburg and check out Johannesburg and see what that's like. You, you should. See how that's, that's changed. That's where I'm from. Yeah, I know. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's because, you know, when I was here in 92, it was such a dangerous place. Now I hear it's gotten so beautiful. Well, it was always beautiful. It, it was, you know, I was, I was amazed at the beauty of the, of, of the country, you know, and, and the city. And, uh, but we were always kind of nervous when we were there, you know, now, it, it feels like it's uh, <laughs> feels like it's one of the places to be. Mr. Ernest Dickerson, thank you so much um, for your time, uh, for you to join us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So we've got some questions, um, and they will go in the order of Abongile, who is who was the shadow uh, for Ernest during Raised by Wolves. Abongile would like to ask a question, and we also have. Bongi, who is part of the ACE program, and Bongi uh, has been working with Scott Free Productions in the writer's room, so really excited to hear her question. And we also have Julie Nadi, who is a filmmaker and a video. He's, she's actually got a studio here in Cape Town, actually, um, the Mothership, the, co the founder of the Mothership down here in Cape Town. I just wanted to do a quick introduction of them, but I'll, I'll hand it over to Abongile for his question. Great. My name is Abongwe El Boy, and I've had the privilege of being able to work very closely as Ernest's, uh, Mr. Dickerson's uh, director's assistant for the past two months. And it's been an uh, incredibly enlightening experience just seeing him work interpersonally, how he connects with the actors and the different crew members. And so, so my question is for you um, specifically. Um, you're credited with creating a large body of, of really culturally impactful um, pieces of art. Um, from Malcolm X to Juice to Do the Right Thing. But for you, which film do you think was the most impactful in your own learning experience for yourself? Like the film that really shaped how you work and how you think and how your, 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 the process of filmmaking is for you? Uh, tough question because I, I think I'm always learning. I'm still learning. Um, every film is... Uh, is a learning experience. Every film teaches me something new um, about dealing with actors, about you know uh, how to approach material, about uh, new technology. Um, so it, it's hard for me to say that any one film did that. I think they all do because. Uh, to be perfectly honest with you, every time before I start a film, I'm scared to death, terrified, because I know a lot of stuff is going to happen, and I just don't know what is going to happen, but I know that I just got to weather the storms, because that's what's going to happen. Every day, there's going to be storms, and you got to just weather them, and each one teaches you something new. Um, you know, on this show, you know, just dealing with the different personalities of the actors, and their different ways of of approaching material. No two actors are the same. They all approach material differently. Um, and so you have to find out what's going to be best for them and how you can help them get to where you need them to be. Um, also working with uh, the crew, uh, you know, just um, discovering, you know, finding new stuff like the crane shot we did yesterday with the uh, with the camera on the magnet, you know, it was a it was a technocrane and it started high and it came down, but the camera was on an electromagnet so that as it got to a certain point, the magnet could be turned off and the camera could be slid into handheld mode and continue going into another room, all in one smooth move. So every time, you know, you're always, you know, learning something new. Um, and I think I'm <laughs> gonna be that way till the day I die. Thank you so much, sir. Mm -hmm. When you start making your films, bear that in mind. Everyone's going to be everyone's going to be a learning experience, and no two no two are going to be the same. Hi. Hi. My hi. My name is Bongi. I just wanted to find out. Um, I am a scriptwriter, so as a South African emerging filmmaker, 
who can I approach to, to, to sell my feeling? Let's say in LA. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, well, the system is set up that in order to get your scripts out, it's best to have an agent. Um, now, how do you get an agent? Uh, sometimes the best way to get an agent is to try and do the film yourself. Um, you know, so many, that's how so many filmmakers get discovered, you know, they're, that they're able to finance the film with whatever money they have in pocket and, um, and, and, and write a script that they can do for that amount of money. Uh, Spike did that with uh, She's Gotta Have It, um, which was the film that first really put him in the limelight. He, uh, he basically got money from, that his grandmother gave him and was able to write a script that took place within like a four block radius. So whenever we went to a new location, it was basically just putting the camera on the shoulder and walking a couple of blocks, you know. So, but that film got seen because it went to it went to uh, festivals, and um, and that's one of the things you can do, you know, is to write a film that you think you can you can make or partner with a director to uh, to have made, um, and shoot it. And people are shooting films on cell phones. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you so much. Good luck with that. Uh, yeah, um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much. What have been your frustrations generally? Like, it's a very generic question, but if, if anything comes to mind, um, something that I can uh, maybe relate to, all of us can relate to, I'm sure they're not that different, but it's interesting to hear it from someone who's been working for so long. Thank you. Well, the biggest frustrations... Um, I think usually it's financing, <laughs> you know, getting the money to get a project made. That's the biggest, uh, that's the biggest hurdle that, uh, that, that you have to overcome. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's something you never stop dealing with. You, you're always trying to find uh, money to make to, to do your projects. Uh, you know, I've been lucky that I've been able to have a living, you know, in, in television. So, you know, I've been able to send my kids to college and, <laughs> and all that other good stuff and, you know, live reasonably comfortable. But there's still some projects that I want to make, you know, um, myself that uh, the biggest hurdle is finding the money to do it. That's always, that's the big filmmaking dilemma. That's the thing you... That's, that's, uh, yeah. that's comforting. I can relate. Yeah. That's comforting. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's the thing that always makes you say, I wish I had found something that didn't require so much money to, oh, yeah. to, to, to get it done, you know? I was actually thinking, wondering if there's a sweet spot in terms of budgeting films. Um, if you can sort of work within certain budgets and uh, still manage to sort of uh, put out really great work, especially in the independent space, <laughs> where, you know, it doesn't take you six years to raise, to raise money for a film. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, some amazing movies have been made for, for very, very little money. Uh, like Minari, two, $2 million. Um, you know, and, you know, how do you put a well-known actor in that? You make, you make the actor uh, an executive producer on the film so that maybe he doesn't Give make... Give him a little bit of uh, equity? Yeah, and also the credit, okay. you know, because they can say that especially if the film was successful, they can say that I was an executive producer on this and, and you know, um, and then they also get some of the return on the back end, hopefully, you know, but that's one way. I think we have another question from Julie. Hello. Hi. Hello. Um, thank you to you, Mr. Dixon, and thank you so much, Cecil, for facilitating this chat. Thank you, Shumela, as well. Um, I'm quite interested in um, how you have uh, kind of facilitated your relationship with genre, just looking at um, your history and the kind of, um, you know, yeah, the, the, the kind of um, meandering and experimenting uh, through means of storytelling 
I'm wondering if, it, if that's deliberate in how you um, approach uh, filmmaking. And again, um, both in the television sense and um, in the traditional film sense, like does this make um, a difference to you? Or is it one of those things where it's like, if the writing hits, <laughs> then that's all you need? Well, the, what always, the first thing that attracts me to anything is, is the script. Is the script interesting? No matter what genre it is, you know, is it is it interesting? Is it uh, if if I read a script and five pages in I know exactly how it's going to end, I lose all interest in it, you know. Right. Um, but now, you know, but you know, I've been lucky to uh, be able to pick and choose. You know, I get sent, I get, I get a lot of scripts that I don't yeah. that I don't want to do, but it has to appeal to me. It has to appeal to me in the story, but also if I can find ways of telling it the way I want to. I, mm. my primary tool is the camera. I've always been a photographer. So all my, insp all my inspiration are directors who do use the camera to tell the story. Mm. And I'm always trying to find a project, if it's a, if it's a, a television script that I get, is this something I can really sink my teeth into? Right. You know, so yeah. um, no matter what genre it is, and and I don't think genre has to be that limiting. Yeah, I think people now are really uh, you know taking genre into some interesting areas. You know, especially mm -hmm. especially filmmakers and writers of color. You know, um, mm -hmm. you know because uh, I, I don't know if you saw Lovecraft Country, but that's one way of of doing it. Yes. And also, uh, Watchmen was another way of doing it, and and, mm -hmm. and it's in so much of the writing now. Uh, mm. There was a writer who Peel. you should read a writer named. Uh, it was a, a book called The Ballad of Black Tom by Del mm. Val. It's you know taking the racism of H. P. Lovecraft and turning it on its head. Really t mm. looking at one of his stories from a totally different direction, and it's. It's great, you know, it's, it's, it takes yeah. the limitations that one person put on the genre, tearing down those limitations mm -hmm. and doing something else entirely different with it. And I think that's right. what's great about what's happening today. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's Melissa DC here, I'm a screenwriter and director. I'm also with the ACE program, uh, adventure program, I'm working with Scott Free and in development and script writing. Um, thank you, first of all, just for giving us access to you and your mind and your expertise, uh, and just helping us get some more understanding about filmmaking, especially from the state side, which I know a lot of people want to have their work sort of end up there, just so it can be seen by a lot more people. Uh, and thank you again, Spies, as well, for hosting today. Um, I read an article that you gave to the American Society of Cinematographers, where you cited your um, uncle, I believe, his name is al Haj Dawood Haroon, mm -hmm. as a key mentor to you. I think he introduced you to like David Lean's Oliver and helped you get your first camera and, and stuff. Um, can you just, just explain to us the, the significance of that relationship? Because he sounds like a pretty cool guy. Um, but the, the, the significance of having that kind of uh, mentorship relationship um, as a young budding filmmaker and perhaps what advice you could give to uh, uh, other filmmakers now who perhaps feel they don't have uh, a specific person they can turn to as a mentor, uh, either professionally or personally. Yeah, well, he was a really cool guy. My uncle passed away two, two years ago. I think it's two. Gosh, I forget how much time has gone by now. But yeah, he, um, he was my mother's brother. And uh, my dad died when I, was, uh, when I was eight years old. So he was kind of like a second father and uh, a big brother to me. And... Um, you know, growing up, you know, just, uh, he was a jazz musician. So he always used to take me to his practice sessions when I, because he lived in Boston. I lived in New Jersey. Whenever I was in Boston, I would always go to his practice sessions with him. You know, I was always interested in meeting the musicians and everything. And then when he moved to New York, you know, same thing. I would, you know, I'd go to jazz practice sessions with him. And, and we would always stay up late at night looking at movies when I could, you know, when I wasn't going to school, you know, like in the summertime or on weekends. And he just um, turned me on to so many different films. So um, I was lucky to have him in my life to uh, 
helped direct me in the areas that, you know, I, I guess I wanted to go to. So, and I mean, I've tried to do that with, uh, with my sons, you know, they're, two of my sons are now in the film business, uh, working as an assistant cameraman. But it, it is, it's important to have a mentor or somebody like that that can, that can turn you on to new stuff. Um, I was lucky to have him. I mean, do you have anybody like that? That, that. Uh... I'm. I. Yes and no, but also I. I think I've come to realize the older I've gotten that it is possible to to have people that you haven't met sort of be like a, a mentor. Um, uh, what's her name? Rada Blank, who did the Forty Old Version. I just saw that movie and said, whoever she is, whatever she's about, I want to sort of go in that sort of you know, follow that road, just the sort of uh, uh, freedom she had to be honest and to write a screenplay that was so honestly about her life and about her experiences about Harlem and gentrification, all the stuff that the film deals with. But she did it in such a, a, an imaginative way. I, I sort of said to myself, well, it's possible to have a mentor that is in your life, but it's also possible to have somebody who's not necessarily specific in your life that you can turn to and say, hey, that's a person I can emulate and look up to. Yeah. I mean, you know, the great thing about it is that now there's uh, uh, there's there's a lot of material out on you know different authors, you know, different or, or and, and different filmmakers. You know, yeah, the lives of certain filmmakers do fascinate me. You know, I learned a lot by reading uh, you know books on Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, there's a couple of great books on the, the British filmmaker Michael Powell that mm -hmm. I got a lot of uh, inf in, inspiration. So in a way, that's kind of like having a mentor. I, what is it by proxy? I guess you know, not you know, not having an exact mentor. By, but you know, the thing is, you just keep reading. You know, you always, uh, you know, always looking for material, always studying. You know, um, there's also a lot of um, like podcasts now and yeah. series and that sort of, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I collect DVDs and Blu-rays, and there's so much material on some of them about how certain movies were made mm. that could give you a wealth of information. I mean, I'm, I'm working on a show now that's, Ridley Scott is one of the producers, and uh, I've been hip to Ridley Scott since 1978 when I first saw The Duelists in the movies. And so I've followed his career, but uh, um, just the other night, uh, my wife and I were watching, we watched uh, Gladiator again, but then we also watched mm -hmm. The Making Of, mm -hmm. you know. And when you're making a movie or, or directing a show, that kind of stuff is always helpful. You know, it's always, you know, looking at that is always, uh, uh, you know, pretty cool. So, you know, I would, you know, I would say just keep looking and reading and, and finding material. And, and uh, I would say get yourself a, do you have a DVD player? I do have a very wide DVD collection. There you right go. Now, so. That's what I like. To, I like go. that. Yeah. <laughs> just um, just keep looking at films, man. You know, and and know your history and study the history of mm. of films. You know, my favorite director is Orson Welles. You know, so mm. everything I can find on Orson, you know, I'm you know I just grab, you know, even on the internet, everything I can find. So mm. you know, just keep that up. So I guess in a way, that's having a mentor. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Hi, hi, uh, Mr. Dickerson, and hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for, for this talk. It's been really amazing um, and so inspiring. So my, my question is, uh, you know, you've, you've done so much work and you've been so prolific, um, and I'm a huge fan also of your work, I have to say. Thank you. Um, but my question is really how... How have you managed to have this very long career doing such meaningful and impactful work, but also doing work that's commercially viable? So, so, the, so the question is kind of two parts, like how have you managed to do that and what, how would you advise us younger filmmakers in the industry in terms of doing work that we, that's important to us or that has kind of a you know, societal impact or that we feel is meaningful, but also at the same time being successful, you know, like commercially in the sense of being able to continue the work we're doing. 
um, and kind of making a living out of it. Um, how would you, how would you uh, advise us going forward in terms of doing that? Um, well, you know, uh, always looking for material that you know, you can really, um, like I said, sink your teeth into. You know, for me, I never, I never, I never thought of it as a job, you know, because, I mean, filmmaking is hard work. <laughs> so at, while you're at it, you may as well enjoy it, you know. I've never, it's been a long time since I've taken a job just for the money. I've, I'm lucky now that I can I can be selective in what I go after, but I've always been selective, you know, because uh, there were some scripts I wouldn't touch either because the material didn't um, appeal to me. I wouldn't take something where the material didn't appeal to me because I know I wouldn't do a good job. You you have to do something. You have to read a piece of material that's going to really you know, unleash something inside of you, a desire to really just like live that project for as long as you're on it. Um, and, uh, you know, so that you feel good about getting up at 4.30 in the morning and going in and spending 10 to 12 hours on a set, on a film set. Um, so for me, I think it's, you know, be, be very selective, you know, if, if scripts come your way or, or if you have a piece of material that you want to adapt, you know, do it because you love it, you know, because you have to love it. You have to love doing it, you know, because, <laughs> you know, I mean, after, after you get the gray hairs on one shoot, you're looking for the next one, you know, so that, that must be love, I guess. So I think that's it. You have to love what you're doing and not just take something just... Uh, for the money. And if you, but I'll also say this, if you're in a situation where you have to take something for the money, try and find some way of, try and get something out of it for yourself, you know, um, that's going to make it worth, you know, doing every day. Does that help? Very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good luck, man. Thanks. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Dickerson, and also to Sfiso. Um, It was really great to, to be here. Um, I just had a quick question. I feel like it's hard um, to kind of reflect on, on your work and also not uh, reflect on your relationship with Spike Lee. Um, and I was just curious about the kind of moment for you when you decided it was time to step out from behind the camera because I feel like that was obviously for you a very important decision to then um, kind of go and, and, and kind of go into directing, which is, which is obviously what you have focused on for your career. So I'm, I'm curious about that. And I feel like, you know, filmmaking is such a, it's such a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a relationship often, you know, it's a relationship with the people that we make films. It is a really hard thing to do. You can't do it alone. Um, and those kind of key relationships exist between a director or a DOP or a producer and a writer or a producer and a director. So, um, you know, to like, to make that kind of break in a way. Um, and then also when you did start getting, when you did start entering into the spaces where, you know, you were dealing with uh, the networks and the studios, um, how did you navigate those spaces? Did you, I mean, did you have good people in your corner who are helping you to navigate that? Um, did you find new relationships that then you could rely on? So I'd love to just hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Um, whew, that's a lot. <laughs> uh, well, with Spike, um, you know, we, we, um, we met in film school. We met at, at New York University Graduate Film School. Um, he was a uh, directing major, I was a cinematography major, and I shot his student films, two of his student films. Um, and then we continued on. Um, in that period, in that time after I graduated from film school, 
before I got my first job as a cinematographer, uh, my partner Gerard Brown and I wrote uh, Juice. It was, uh, you know, an idea that had been kind of like gestating in my head for years, ever since I lived in Washington, D.C., you know, seeing young kids that looked like they'd been hanging out all night, wondering what kind of things they were getting into. Um, and since, you know, when Juice, when I couldn't get Juice sold, you know, my career as a cinematographer was doing fine. And then, um, and then one day, uh, years later, um, I was finally able to make the film. And Spike was very supportive. Um, he was very supportive of it. I mean, so supportive that while I was in post-production for Juice and he had announced he was going to do Malcolm X, and I told him I wanted to come back and shoot it because that was one of our, when we first met, when we talked about our dreams, filming the autobiography of Malcolm X was a dream for both of us. And so after I directed Juice, I went back and photographed Malcolm X. And he actually delayed pre-production by two weeks to allow me to finish the post on Juice, which, you know, which ain't easy, you know. And, um, you know, we've, we've stayed friends throughout the years. Uh, he brought me in on uh, Miracle of Santa Ana as a second unit director, cinematographer in Italy. You know, and that was Spike offering me eight weeks in, in Tuscany, you know, to shoot. Who's going to turn that down? Not me. So, um, you know, so it was cool. And, you know, we've been um, very supportive of each other. You know, we're not, I think, I'm, I think neither of us think that there isn't a time when we won't work together again. I think we're both trying to find that time when that will happen. But, uh He's been very supportive, and he's, and he's still a friend. Um, in dealing with uh, networks, uh, it helps to have a really strong and good producer to be the buffer, you know. Um, the, my, I think my best films, or my best shows, have all been for cable, cable and streaming. Uh, the, the regular networks like CBS, NBC, ABC, there's a certain style of, of, of filmmaking that they want, uh, which I just can't do. You know, the streaming services, they're looking for more filmmakers. So that became very you know, evident when I first started working in television on, on a show like The Wire. The Wire wanted filmmakers. I was able to approach each episode like, like I would a film. I didn't have to shoot everything I could think of and let the editor put it together, which is the way a lot of television shows are shot. On the, on the big networks. Um, and so, you know, I opted for like less money, you know, because you don't make as much money doing those cable shows as you would on the big network show. But, you know, but for me, um, being able to face myself in the morning and be happy with what I did means much more than, you know, more money. Um, so, but, you know, even dealing with them, having a strong producer who's a buffer, you know, um, it's usually the producer is the one that has to deal with the networks and keep them away from the director. So, did that help? <laughs> did I miss, is there something that I missed? Okay, cool. I just wanted to take a, a, the opportunity to also thank uh, Sefiso. Thank you for being here. Thank you for moderating and uh, helping us um, with this conversation. Thank you so much, Ernest. Thank for you being for here with me. us, um, I'm all. I'm. I'm sure we all took something home with us. Uh, you've given us gems, and it's so good to get to know you a little bit more. Get to know your journey. We're so honored to have had you here. Um, a big thank you to also Seaton, to Cheryl, to Marissa. Just a quick shout out to the hands that have really helped uh, mold and uh, bring this project to life. We have come to the end of our conversation. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you.